Excellent. Right. A very warm welcome to everybody this morning. Uh, my name is Pete Thompson, and I'm delighted to be asked to help chair today and to chair this meeting. And it's great to see so many of you here today. There's um, people that I've known a long time here. We'll come back to that in just a moment, Adrian. Um, fantastic meeting. The agenda's great. The faculty are fantastic. I think it's it's very rare to have a meeting that really brings together like-minded people who are interested not in metal and plastic but on trying to repair the knee and I really congratulate Joint Operations on putting this together. A couple of housekeeping things, um, there's no fire alarm test this morning so if it happens we, we better leave. Toilets and coffee are out there, I think a lot of you were here, we were, uh, were here yesterday. Um, I've also been asked to mention that if you want to tweet and get a bit of uh, noise about this meeting then it's hashtag rockstar 2017 so those of you who are into that then please uh, get tweeting today um, also you've only been here less than 24 hours and most of you are already in the doghouse because you haven't filled in your evaluation forms and becky's going to be after you so please let's fill those in this is a fantastic meeting and i hope that this will become an annual meeting and we would really like some feedback to to let us know how we can uh, improve it okay so um i have actually told my children that i'm uh, chairing a meeting of rock stars today um, and they were very interested in that and there are a few members of the faculty that i've known a very long time and to me they are rock stars in fact, Adrian Wilson was at university with my wife, Sally, and Sally um, sent me a photo of him, pulled out a photo of him pretty early on in his medical school career. And he wasn't always quite as bright, but he is a rock star. And this is Adrian trying to understand the anatomy and function of the anterior cruciate ligament. And he's moved on a lot from there. Martin Snow, he was a lot cooler than he is now. And this is Martin turning up to his finals at Edinburgh University uh, in the 1990s. Of course, many of us feel, particularly working in the NHS, that we're more at this end of our rock star careers. Um, but I hope there's a wealth of experience in the room today and that you're all going to contribute in the discussion bits and we'll, um, we'll have a great day and learn a lot from each other. So I've been asked with saying how far should we go in this regeneration of the knee and to present to you a sort of a treatment algorithm. Well, I'm not going to give you that many answers. I really just want to set the scene over the next five or ten minutes about what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm Pete Thompson. I work in Coventry. I've been a consultant there since 2005. Did my training in London and a fellowship in Australia. And really to sort of set us off, this is the problem we're dealing with quite an extreme example but this guy's only 32 had an ACL reconstruction at the age of 23 it's about 10 years later he's ruptured his graft he's got very little meniscal tissue in the lateral compartment he can see you can see that there's full thickness damage on both the tibia and the femur and it's all very well reconstructing the ACL to give stability to the knee but we know that it's the other damage to the knee the rest of the damage that really affects outcome so for the first half of the morning, we're going to be talking um, about this stuff, which you all know about, articular cartilage and how we might get this to, to repair. You know it's got a very low cell count, no blood supply, and its ability to heal itself is very poor. You know about the orientation of the collagen fibres in articular cartilage and how that reflects the function of the different layers and the intimate bond with the bone. And we're going to be hearing some different views from experts about how important it is to maintain that uh, subchondral bone plate. Articular cartilage takes massive forces. You can see patellofemoral joint jumping with 55 megapascals through the articular cartilage. Really huge forces. And once, it damage, once it's damaged, it's very difficult to get it to repair we see different patterns of damage. The first of all, this persistent mechanical overload of the articular cartilage, which leads to incremental surface wear. And that can be influenced hugely by alignment of the knee and by loss of the meniscus. And then you also see catastrophic shear injury really occurring in the type of mechanisms that cause ligament injury or patellar instability that can shear off full thickness parts of the articular cartilage. So when it's damaged, we're not quite sure what to do, and we're going to be hearing some experts uh, from experts this morning about that and their different experiences of AMIC, both in the knee and in the ankle, and also hearing about how you might maximise the number of important cells, the fibroblast colony forming units within the um, aspirates that we take from patients. There's general agreement that the meniscus is 
hugely important in the knee and once you've damaged the meniscus it will lead to degeneration in the knee. Now how quickly that happens depends on these sorts of factors. Okay? And many of us who believe in this type of surgery would hope that we can influence some of these things. Admittedly difficult to uh, influence a patient's genetics and in my experience even more difficult to influence their weight um, but we can influence some of these things to try and slow down the rate of progression. So we'll be hearing a bit about meniscus, not about resection or repair, but about reconstruction and replacement of the meniscus. We'll be hearing about some synthetic meniscal replacements, and then my colleague Nick Smith, who will be giving a really important um, talk later on, just after lunch, about meniscal transplantation and touching on some evidence of whether, the, whether we're actually slowing down the rate of progression of arthritis. Also accepted amongst all of us is the importance of alignment and abnormal alignment really influences the progression and development of, of, of arthritis in compartments, either compartment of the knee. And Adrian Wilson has been fantastic, done huge work in uh, pushing osteotomy forwards in the UK. Um, I personally believe that osteotomy is one of the few operations that we do that really influences the future for a patient and we'll be hearing from Adrian about his experience of osteotomy. An alternative approach um, when you're faced with focal areas of damage on the joint surface is to replace it either with osteochondral allografts or with metal resurfacings and Martin Snow is going to be talking to us about osteochondral allografts later. This is a really exciting area for me. It's something we're really interested in in Coventry. Tim Spaulding and I did our second or third case last week and I think with the difficulties with um, some of the other cartilage repair procedures that have happened really around cost. This is an area that's really taken off uh, in the UK and we're looking forward to that talk. <coughs> also replacing with metal resurfacings and again you know focal metal resurfacings have become popular and we're going to be hearing about those. So you know at the end of the day this is what we're all trying to put off okay partial or total knee replacement and maybe by influencing these patients at an early stage we are putting off knee replacement and if we're able to do that we can maybe put off a revision knee replacement in that patient's lifetime. But how do we sort of decision make on what to do with these patients? Well this is a, a nice treatment algorithm which I think just helps you think about planning surgery in these people. This was presented by Tim Spaulding uh, I think last year really focusing on the meniscal deficient knee symptomatic patient with meniscal deficiency, do they have intact rim and anterior and posterior horns? If so, then maybe um, a scaffold's indicated. If not, then really the only option is to go ahead with a meniscal transplantation. Are there other problems in terms of alignment or instability or cartilage lesions? If so, yes, we can add in some additional surgery to correct those. And it's just a nice way of thinking of approach for these patients. If your emphasis, though, is perhaps more articular cartilage than meniscus, then maybe it could read this way. <coughs> Symptomatic cartilage lesion, is it full thickness? Yes, we're into some form of cartilage repair surgery. If not, then maybe we can influence the knee biologically. And I think we'll, a lot of you were here yesterday for the Lipogems talk. Maybe we've got some biological things which are progressing now that we can do to influence the knee. If there's other problems like instability, malalignment, meniscal deficiency, then we can add in some additional surgery. So we just thought that was a, a helpful algorithm just to think about approaching these type of patients. I think we do need to be honest with ourselves though. There are big challenges for biological arthroplasty surgeons and one of the biggest ones is, is how do we judge outcome in these patients. Is it function and quality of life that's important, in which case we're looking really into PROM scores. But are the current PROM scores we have really sensitive enough to pick out the differences in a lot of these patients? Probably not. Are we aiming to prevent osteoarthritis in these patients, in which case how do we prove that? How do we quantify it and then over what period of time are we really looking to do that? Is it just a case of survivorship? Now, personally, I think that's unfair to, to compare a lot of these procedures to survivorship with total knee replacement. So it'll be interesting to get your views on some of this uh, in the discussions that we have. Also, we in partly encourage our surgeons to get back to, our patients rather, back to high risk activities. 
Uh, and this is, you know, the same as George Best having his liver transplant and going back to boozing. You know, we have this dilemma that we should be advising patients not to do some of the sport, but secretly we want them to get back because we want to test out these procedures. We want to know how successful they'll be. The other issues we have are, are expense, and they are expensive, some of these procedures, not only to, to trusts, and that's influencing whether we can do them in our trusts, but also insurance companies are cottoning onto this and won't, won't authorise it. A lot of the procedures are new, which mean we have to navigate our new procedures committees within our hospitals, and even if we've got agreement within the hospital, we have to get the CCGs to pay for them. And not only expensive in money, they're expensive in time for some of our rehab colleagues. They're also high risk. The patients, some of them are actually doing quite a lot, but they want to be able to do more. I had a disastrous case with a 22-year-old girl that I did a meniscal transplant on last year who woke up with dense tibial and common perineal nerve lesions, which um, we couldn't quite work out why it had happened and eventually explored the nerves a few weeks later. And, and fortunately, over a couple of months, she made a completely full recovery. But we weren't really sure why that had happened. So she'd gone from being hill walking and having pain to actually having a paralyzed foot. And clearly, it's high risk activity. And some of you surgeons may think you're quite brave and um, be akin to my mate Buster Gonads. So finally, I just want to read the first part of this, maybe a bit too small for you to read. This is from um, Tim Spaulding and Alan Getgood's great paper last year in Kister, just talking about defining outcome after meniscal transplant. He says, the overall goal of MAT is to achieve symptom-free activities of daily living without swelling or pain. Light sport should be a bonus with an overall ambition to conserve knee function. Patients should be warned of a failure in the future and the need for fine-tuning surgery in the short and midterm, maybe up to 30% of cases. A 17-year-old presenting with pain and severe restriction in function and therefore quality of life now is interested in the here and now, not wanting to be active in sport and to be able to work. So a fix that provides such outcome is arguably valid, but what if the graft fails at the age of 27, having provided 10 years of good function? Should that be declared a failure? So it's sort of food for thought, and really just wanted to go through that just to set up the, the, the meeting for the rest of the morning. So that's all I'm going to say to start with. We're going to have a slight change to the programme um, in that Adrian is a very, very important man and has to rush off later on this morning. So he's going to start off talking about osteotomy and then we're going to go back into the cartilage repair. So thank you very much and over to Adrian.